Welcome back to more Disco Elysium. If you are enjoying the content, be sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe if you're not already. Let's get into it. Let's look behind the curtain before I get out of here. Also need to talk with the librarian. You see a set of tattered curtains blocking the way to another room. A strange cage-like trinket dangles from the curtains. Excuse me, officer. The back room is strictly for employees only. Shopkeeper, what's behind the curtains? Nothing. Now please go back to browsing the books. Don't you feel compelled to look at the books? The books are all you care about. She fiddles with her pendant. That's the second time she's fiddled with that pendant, so I need to keep that in mind when I talk with her. She speaks almost as if she's trying to put a spell on you, urging you to buy more books. Oddly enough, the more she tries to draw you away from the curtains, the more alluring they become. Examine the strange cage-like trinket. You see some kind of charm, an irregular polyhedron assembled from bones, sticks, and straw. Inside, a disturbing fish head with empty eye sockets stares at you. Very odd. This is a traditional Seminese ward, meant to provide protection against ill luck bad dreams, curses, and other supernatural scourges. And who are the Seminis? Inhabitants of Ile de Fenton, the Seminide Islands down south. Aside from poking at it suspiciously, there is nothing else to do with the fishhead charm at this time. The curtains remain shut before you. No, no, no. We're going to pull them open. We're pulling open the curtains. We have authority here as law officers. Just as you're about to pull apart the curtains, the petrified voice of the shop owner cries out once more. Sir, don't touch that. I told you it's off limits for the customers. Her hands are closed around her pendant, her fingers nervously playing with the talisman. Parapsychologically speaking, we're done if you decide to open them. I won't be held responsible for the consequences. It's too dangerous. She looks away, mumbling. Why is everyone always messing with the curtains? Why can't they just buy books like normal people? Hmm. Let me take a look. Ma'am, this is different. I'm a police officer. I need to get in there. Why? It's not like anyone was killed there. She stops abruptly as her hand flies over her mouth, baffled by her own bluntness. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be so impolite. Just please don't go there. I can't allow that. You'll only make things worse and unleash the powers. This is about the curse. That's why you're afraid. No, it's just a storeroom for the employees. I told you. Now please step away from the curtains. She's almost begging you. But I sense this place calling for me. I must investigate beyond the threshold. You do? My god, even more reasons not to mess with the curtains. Just step away, dear sir. I don't care. You can't stop me. I'll open them. No. Please just talk to me, officer. Come here and let's talk this through before you decide to do anything extreme. Talking is always good. Go see what she has to say. There is something mysterious about the curtains. Be careful. The curtains, tattered with age and covered in dust, hang before you, as if taunting you. Okay, I'm gonna ignore them for now. And I will talk to her. Welcome to Crime, Romance, and Biographies of Famous People. My name is Plaisance. The clerk extends a greeting. Be welcome, and please take responsibility for the energy you bring into this space. A golden pendant hangs around the woman's neck in the shape of what looks like a tiny fish head trapped in amber. Before we go on, you seem to be well off enough. Can you give me some money? I feel there won't be an opportune moment to ask later. I love this character. Sir, don't be ridiculous. I certainly will not give you money. I would be doing you a grave psychic disfavor. She gives you a disapproving look. One has to earn one's success, even if one is a police officer. Handouts are nothing but manipulation. All they do is make you dependent. Certainly there are good things to be said about dependence. 
Let me see what I can do this. Okay, it would forge ties between us working people. Good practice for fighting our common enemy. Now, hey there. Sounds like someone isn't taking responsibility for the energy they bring into this space. Fighting enemy. My philosophy is everyone just getting along. A curious pendant you're wearing. Oh, yes. Helps to have an anchor in these times. She clutches her pendant and narrows her eyes as well. So you're the owner of this store. I am. The proudest owner of our little shop of culture. Her voice is high-pitched, as if to give more penetration. Why are you so uptight about those curtains? I just want to know what's on the other side. I already told you. It's just a storage room for employees. I don't understand why it's so important to you. Just let it go, officer. Go buy some goddamn books. You're supposed to be drawn to the books. She recites it like it's a poem, or like she's playing a role she's grown tired of. Let's see. If it's just a storage room, then why does it have a Seminese ward protecting it? It's just for decoration. She wavers under your gaze, mouth pressed into a tight-lipped smile, then something breaks. Okay, fine. It's just because this place is cursed, just like everyone said. They don't call it the doomed commercial area for nothing. Are you happy now, officer? Happy that you've ruined everything? She closes her eyes and starts mumbling something to her pendant. How does this curse manifest itself? The curse is so much worse than you could imagine. It's a disease eating at the very foundation. A shiver runs through the woman as she looks around the dimly lit store. It's the curse of financial distress, of ruin and bankruptcy. She peers at the curtains again. Didn't, didn't that curtain just move? Ah, Annette mentioned that the previous tenants have experienced some financial troubles. It's not just that, officer. We're dealing with something supernatural here. It's the cacodemons feeding off bad business practices and disappointing income statements. There's something wrong with this building, I can tell you. Ever since I arrived, I've sensed an eerie lingering presence, as if I was unwanted here. And why didn't you just tell me right away that it that it isn't the curse. It's not good to talk about the curse, not in detail. The negativism, it's dangerous. Talking about the void wraiths angers them. Wow, void wraiths. You have new words. Have you sought help from anyone? Yes, I've contacted numerous parapsychologists and even a pair of Simonese mediators. They provided me with the wards. She nods at the strange cage-like trinket on the curtains. The wards help to keep the doom at bay and protect us against the darkness that lies further in the building. Even though now I fear, it's not enough. Is your pendant part of the ward as well? Oh, this! No, it's a special Hymian amulet, blessed by desert pygmy shamans with a spell of compulsion. It's to compel people to buy books. There are numerous spells cast throughout the store, I had the books anointed with a different inducement spell, for example. It's guaranteed to boost sales 15%. Desert Pygmy Shamans. That sounds like a rather questionable way to describe a group of people. Would you like me to take the case? I could investigate, see if the curse is real. Most certainly not. I don't want anyone who's not familiar with the psychic arts to get involved in this mess. Stay away. Leave the spirits be, so they can return to their slumber. My liege, you know what this case calls for? A para-detective. So, let me try to convince her to investigate. I got an 83% chance here. Slither up to her, you silver-tongued fiend. Show her what world-class perfidy looks like. Ma'am, I came here to help. I've handled paranatural situations before. Are you sure? Don't think I haven't seen charlatans before. 
I sense the psychic emanations from afar, the sleeper beyond calls out. I'm not sure I can trust your claims. Honestly, you look like a bit of a drinker. I'm sorry for being so blunt, but... The lieutenant keeps his usual stony calm. He silently picks out his notebook. Go ahead then, rock her world, he thinks. I'll compose some notes. I admit I've had my share of drinks, but only because the spectral realm is parapsychologically taxing. How do you know all this? Here we go. Your words brought me here in the first place. The Seminese blood also runs through me. You're part Seminese. Oh, it means our meeting couldn't have been mere chance. The hand of fate guides us. But I am not the only one at risk. I have to think of my daughter. You are certain you can help us? Keep us safe? I can't allow any collateral damage to hit us. Just ask my partner Kim, he'll vouch for me. Oh, uh... The lieutenant mumbles in minor confusion. He has not been listening closely enough. You've put him on the spot. I can assure you, he is a, a police officer. Very knowledgeable. If you promise, good officer, then you might be our last hope. Do you swear it? A hand on your heart. On my honor. Thank you, sir. There's one more thing I haven't told you about yet. The entity. Do not act surprised. You know of these things, sire. Of course, the entity. For I have sensed its presence. You have? The entity takes the form of a woman. A witch, probably. I've suspected that she must be connected to the curse ever since I first saw her. Did you know that she lives inside the chimney? Chimney. The passage between heaven and hell, of course. Yes. That chimney is part of the building's central furnace, and it's enormous. She has barricaded herself behind some metal security curtains. God knows what she's doing there. Some unnatural magic, I assume. You should go find the entity and ask what happened to all the companies in the building. What is the source of this curse? Here's the key to the warded door behind the curtains. Take it. Oh, and please do return to me after you've looked round. I'm quite anxious to know what she has to say about the curse. What you discover in there. Unbelievable darkness and ruin. What you discover? Probably just some office space. Don't be scared. I had a few more questions about the curse. Okay, but please, only a few questions. You wouldn't want to disturb the spirits. Never mind, I had other questions. The woman before you scans the store, her shoulders rigid and tense. Every now and then, she nudges her glasses. What if I want to buy a book? Goodness, you were already doing good browsing the shelves. Why do you stop? Don't you feel compelled? Go, go, get back there. The books await you. Okay, I'll take another look then. She smiles and nods, seemingly relieved. Your daughter is the one standing outside of the store, right? Annette, yes, my daughter. I hope she wasn't slacking off again with her nose in science fiction. Tell me, was she at her post doing her job like a proper girl? Yes, of course. Wonderful. Did you talk to her? Yes. Great. On a scale of 1 to 10, how compelled were you to buy books after talking with her? 1. Not impressed. I knew it. Shameful behavior. She's incorrigible. Let me see what I want to do here. I get she's a trooper, all right? She looks like she can take it, but it's actually wearing her down. You know, she's been biting her nails. God, ugh. I've told her not to do that. It's such a disgusting habit. She'll get over it. Anxiety is a part of life. No, I don't think she can do anything about it. She can, if she has enough willpower. This is what's called growing pains. Life isn't easy. Life doesn't give breaks. Come on, ma'am. It's obvious she can't do anything about it. 
You are placing an unnecessary burden on a young child. That is true, and obviously the will of the market, but maybe make an exception for your daughter. She stands stiff and severe, silently fuming. Ten or so seconds pass without change. She's looking for one, but there simply aren't any good arguments for being an asshole. Oh no. Hold on. I need to invite her inside and apologize. She must be freezing out there. There. I don't know what to say to you. My husband, he tries to teach me business lessons. I have what my mother called a dull mind. All this stress. Is this husband Annette's father? Yes. My husband is a successful entrepreneur east of the river. If only he were more involved in the business we're running up here. No matter. Soon we'll both be off for Grand Couron. Wait, Grand Couron, what's that? It's a proper place to live. One of the most peaceful neighborhoods east of Jamrock. You may know it for its massive housing projects. Most of the buildings are empty at the moment. It's a great opportunity to get ahead of the crowds. Better times ahead for sure. And your husband's also involved with the bookstore? He made the initial investment. Since then, he's been what you might call a silent partner. Super silent. Almost inaudibly so. Is she an only child? Yes, I'm afraid so. A real treat she is. It would be nice if she had... No, we couldn't have afforded more children, really. Not in this economy. No, of course, yes. This economy. Exactly. She told me she doesn't go to school anymore. She's been too busy, helping me here. So she studied at home this trimester. This is a temporary solution, of course. I assure you, I of all people understand the importance of education. She will be back in school the moment the store takes off. And hell freezes over? Never mind. It's not a good topic to get into. All right, I had something else in mind. The woman looks aloof. Her features much softer. Occasionally, she glances at her daughter's silhouette. Farewell for now, book peddler. So let me talk to Annette. I think she does have a skill check for me, and now that I change shirts, I should have a little bit higher chance to pass it. I'm sorry, sir. I can't talk right now. I'm very busy with my homework. I have... You just can't win. Out of the rain and into the gutter. So yeah, now up to 72, so let me try this again. Because you know each other. She's been talking to you so openly because you've talked before. Ah. Hang on, so you know me. We've met before. Yes, I used to stand out there all the time. Before Mother told me to focus on my homework. You've been running around all week without your shirt on, sir. Telling people about being a star or something. I don't really understand who those stars are. Did I ever talk to you? Of course, you stopped by a few times. You certainly look better than the last time I saw you. What do you mean, better? I look like shit. Yeah, but you don't have party eyes anymore. Party eyes? Yes, of course. That makes sense. I'm not surprised children have seen you running around with party eyes on, he thinks. Not at all. Party eyes? You know, like a cat in the dark. All big and wide-eyed. <laughs> it certainly looks odd on a man. The swiveling eyes of a loony drug addict. That is what she meant. You were probably going into. Fuck yeah. You should get some party eyes right now. Snap those sequins on you, boy. Does that mean I've been partaking in narcotics? Oh, baby. That's not what you have to worry about. Worry about the important thing. So why didn't you tell me you knew me to begin with? I didn't know I had to do that. I don't really like this detective deduction anymore. I guess we can change the subject, sir. I didn't mean to bring you down. What are you doing now? Math. It's really difficult. Like, really. They say you need it to get rich. Better than standing outside in the cold, I guess. Oh, oh, I found something while you were away. What is it? I thought this would fit you. Like, thanks for helping out. Not me. The city, I mean. Like a detective does. 
She gives you a hat, almost exactly like one Dick Mullins wears on the covers. Wait, where did you get it? Just what Dick Mullen would ask. I got it from behind the curtains. I'm not really supposed to go there. It's a uh, fedora? Maybe. It's the hat Dick Mullen wears all the time. He'll look way more serious with that. She grins with joy. Right, I have to get back to my homework now, before Mum notices. Man, this is hard. She looks back at the infernal scribbling under her nose. Okay, bye. See you around, Annette. Okay. Let me look at my brand new hat. Plus one encyclopedia. Okay. There we go. Let me get out of here. Well, my guy is looking very goofy. Let me look here. I have to investigate the Doom commercial area. People say the commercial building on the plaza is cursed. No business will ever thrive there without going bankrupt. You promise Plaisance you'll look into it. Enter the sealed door behind the bookstore and find out what happened to the companies there. Okay. Looking for the malignant entity. Inside of a chimney. You see a set of tattered curtains blocking the way to another room. A strange cage-like trinket dangles from the curtains. Pull the curtains open. You see a dimly lit room full of dusty furniture and trash. A doorway stands in the back, covered in dozens of scary little Sebanese wards. Your shadow looming over it like an omen. Oh! As she tries her best to look away, her round face is buried in her hands. So you know what? I think I have a flashlight here. So I'm gonna put that on on my hand here. That way, if there's anything in the dark, he did say that it helps to see things in dimly lit areas. Ghostly silhouettes of hair dryers. A vaguely androgynous portrait of a man. A heavy door with a missing handle stands before you covered in dozens, if not hundreds, of Semenese trinkets and charms. It appears to be locked. Knock on the door. Only an echo. No one is there. I'm not going to break it down. I will unlock it with the key that I got, obviously. After exerting some force, you manage to turn the key. It's eerily silent. The door slides slightly open, letting a draft of cold air into the room. Uh, Kim, maybe you should go first. Detective, you're the one in charge. Lieutenant motions towards the door. Okay, interesting. Sand is dripping from a punch bag. The poster says Sidious Fortis. The rest is worn off. Worn out wall bars. They look unsafe. Man, I remember these from like elementary school. I forgot these things existed. You go up the stairs here. Oh, actually, I forgot to check my tab key here. There are other things to interact with. A barbell lies on the floor. The color has worn off its weight plates. It's 60 kilograms. Your triceps hum at the sight of these weights. Show the world what kind of beast it's dealing with. Lift them. There are no collars on the barbell. This is a safety hazard. Why does it feel so familiar? Is this familiar because I'm a weightlifter? No, it's not that. It's the stale smell of rubber. The squeaky sound of sneakers. Your bruised knee against the mat, and a whistle. Then, the feeling is gone. Hmm, sounds like wrestling. It's just a memory. Look, Kim, it's a trap. There are no collars on the barbell. You're right. The weight may fall off. Better not touch it then. 
What kind of bastard would just remove the collars? It should be a felony. It would be a violation of EPIS safety regulations if the gym was still operating, but it isn't. No one's supposed to come here anymore. So I don't really want to do this because I only have one health. So if I fail this at 17%, I may die, I guess. So let me leave for now. I do want to look in here and take a look at this. A ball used for playing shot put, a favorite pastime of elderly gentlemen. You feel like you should hold on to this and make good use of it. To sell such a beautiful old school sports equipment would be a sin. So you can sell it, okay. Can I hold it? No. Okay. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Alright. Yeah, let's go up now. The hallway is blocked by old window panes and debris. A large demijohn full of strange liquid. Wild animals stare at you in the dark, stuffed and mounted. Airship rotors covered in spider webs. They remind you of blades. A naked mannequin torso, strange yellow color. Get some money here. Blue velvet, soft to the touch, moth bitten. Let me go up here first and then I'll come around. Yes. Oh, I didn't mean to click him. Your flashlight slides over an old green chalkboard covered in scribbles, sketches, and schemes like some ancient cave mural. Some of the writing has faded with age, but you can still make out sections here and there. Photos and drawings have been pinned to the board. Inspect the drawings. These lithe, pointy-eared creatures appear to be different types of welkins. You make out autumnal candle welkins, casting wax-based magic. Translucent welkins, with organs shining under their skin. And even ether welkins, hailing from the vast emptiness of sidereal space. Who are all those creatures? Fantasies of a tortured, feverish mind? You should adopt one of those Wilkins as your persona. No longer a mere man, but a Welkin. One of the Welkins, towering among the rest, appears to be different, however. Examine the Welkin. This is important. It's Vara Hamira, a high Welkin. His face white and scarred like cracked marble. This is clearly a Welkin supremacist. The note says, all non-Welkin races will be purged. The Haldor, the Tworg, the humans, and even headless men, all of them purged. Imagine a world filled only with Welkin. Green Welkin, Dread Welkin, and the High Welkin to rule them all. An inordinate amount of time has gone into drawing these little Welkin creatures. Who are these creatures? Who drew them? Are they real? I have so many questions. This looks like concept art for a project. It's not really real. Why would anyone spend so much time on this? Some people really like building a world, I think. Even if it's just for a game. One of them is a welcome supremacist. Mm -hmm. Political commentary. That one has a great beard, too. Well, this has to be educational. Let's move on from the welcome. Just look at those details. So much effort. Let's take a look at the photos. The photo collage depicts barren, icy landscapes wrapped in perpetual night. You see permafrost and glacial landforms, dead trees grown in under the snow. Entire oceans have been frozen from shore to shore. There are pictures of settlements on dried up riverbeds, abandoned in a storm. Animal corpses in the dark, carcasses and bones. 
You see primitive oil rigs built into glaciers, boreal dvorg, yurts under the snow, great mammoth-like beasts of burden. Albeit dark and cold, this vision also feels cozy in its own way, like eggnog or morphine, a much-needed respite from our own world. A pinned postcard reads, The heat death scenario, a desperate fight for geothermal energy engulfs the world as Wirral becomes untethered from its sun, drifting through the universe. Let me inspect the schedule. This is a monthly calendar from the year 50. Cryptic words like Sprint, Daily Minimi, and GPI span the marker-drawn grid, the grand scheme of production and money. Minimi stands for a mini-meeting. It's part of a bigger framework for managing work called RUN. Station 41 tried to implement it a few years ago, but failed. What happened? As time goes on, the numbers in the boxes grow rarer and rarer. The board becomes an empty snowfield in the final days. Only failure and regret dwell in this region. Looks like they didn't make it. The lieutenant looks at the frigid ice field of nothingness. A note in the bottom left corner of the chalkboard says, See the prod schedule filament for details. Let's take a look at the notes. The handwriting is only partly legible, but you can still make out three slogans. Call in, tune out, we're all untethered, and heat death of the universe. All right, let me get out of here. Let me look at this thing. This appears to be some kind of machine with a cube-shaped heart and a wired framework. The keyboard has a rectangular on-off button. A piece of paper still hangs from the printer. A radio computer. Just sitting here without anyone inside. You sound surprised, but a bit cautious. Do you think I should turn it on? We have one of these down at the station, but I never really learned how to use it. Let me turn it on the then. The machine lights up like some prehistoric animal stirring from its slumber, revealing fluorescent play and print keys on the keyboard. The hatch on the machine's central compartment is wide open. Okay, let me take a look in the compartment. It's empty, like a beehive without its brood. Some cables have been left dangling, disconnected. This is where the memory should go. Alright, let me press print first before I mess with anything. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing hap nothing happens. Okay, so uh probably I need to put something in there. I don't really have anything besides this ball. Got some chain cutters, pry bars. Okay. Let me take a look at this thing. Well, that's going to take me all the way around. Scribbled across a notebook. Developers of the most advanced RPG in the universe. So somebody was making an RPG game here. Interesting. This old fireplace is covered in lines drawn in blue and red marker. The mesh spreading over the stone like blood vessels on alabaster skin. It looks ghostly and strangely ancient. A diagram for summoning some time-forgotten being. The symbols seem very esoteric. The whole thing resembles Cadran mosaic tiles. Very pathetic. Hold on, how do I know what Kedra mosaic tiles are supposed to look like? History classes. Students with their textbooks open. Studying the roots of our civilization. Those aquarelle blue tiles looked beautiful in the sun. What am I looking at? Radio frequencies, it seems. UKV 123.6. UKV 123.7. UKV 123.9. Some written notes, too. Sparse and cryptic. Radio frequencies for what? Unclear. It looks like a cardiovascular system split into veins and capillaries. Very advanced. Of course. The anatomy of the curse. Perhaps. The web is comprised of radio stations, all lead back to one red heart, titled 
the Game Master frequency. A note says, this one can listen in on any station it wants. It's a game then who's playing. Whoever decides to call in to a call-in station, it looks like. There's no way a little basement studio working here could pull anything like this off. My god. It's as if the less money they had, the more ambitious their project became. Why do you say that? The schedule. I know Doom when I see it. The company was running out of funding. What else? Nothing. It's just lines on marble. An echo from times long gone. No one has used the fireplace in ages. Interesting. So I did level up. And I wonder what I should go with here. Hmm. I don't want to go with visual calculus, maybe? Or perception? Let's see. I like suggestion as well. I'm going to go with suggestion. I want to be able to have a little bit more charming conversations, be able to smooth talk my way out of things. Let's go with that. It looks like he has something to okay. say. What do you think is going on with that computer, chalkboard, and fireplace? Someone tried to exercise the curse. Let's see. So obviously they were trying to make some sort of game, it looks like. But I want to stay in character with my goofy character here. So I'm going to say someone tried to exercise the curse using technology. No, that's not it. I think... The lieutenant takes a step back, steepling his hands. It looks like one of those popular pen and paper role-playing games. Only these people were trying to automate it. Make it work on radio computers. Utter madness, he thinks. As a compliment. And this was a role-playing game? Indeed. Those Welkins are a dead giveaway. Role-playing people love that stuff. The world looks like a modified version of the We Were board game, with heat death thrown in. Super cool. Someone should give them millions of real immediately. This game is too good to be left unfinished. Has anyone ever done this before? Not to my knowledge. They make automated games in Grad, Messina, Konigstein. You know, places with industry. Not in Revachol West, among the ruins. But I don't think anyone has attempted to create an interisolary game before. We just don't have the technology. How are they planning to do that? Through call-in stations. None of the players have to be physically present. Anyone in the world can participate in the game, as long as they have a two-way radio. Then there's the Game Master frequency that listens in on the smaller call-in stations. I think that was supposed to coordinate the stories, functioning as a master of ceremonies of sorts. What do you think happened to the company? No idea. They stopped filling out the schedule on the chalkboard. Wow. Indeed. It's ambitious and untethered from reality, but... Yes, they were insane if they thought they could do this. Yes, especially in here. The lieutenant looks around the derelict room. The pipes howl and a rat crosses the floor in front of your feet. Okay, let's keep moving. Okay. Yeah, let me try to grab this thing, whatever that is. More money. Excellent. Let me come in here. Steel rotor blades bearing a slipstream logo. Skis with slipstream printed on laminated top layer. Production schedule. Memory. The cube-like crisscross of filaments feels oddly fragile in your hands. Its intricate structure covered in dust. Silver tape on the side reads production schedule note. This filament contains information that can be read using a radio computer. Okay. So now I can put that in there, I guess. In here.
I just don't know how to physically put it in there. Tiles on the cube are still smoldering, casting the framework in a soft glow. Fluorescent play and print keys shine on the keyboard. Insert the production schedule. Like a smooth draw, the filament slides into place. On the keyboard, the play key starts blinking. Okay, let me try to print. Nothing happens. Let me play then. A bar of fabric right above the keyboard starts producing a soft hum. The sound of static seeps through the machine's planar magnetic driver. Have you stirred the ghost of the doomed commercial area from its rest? Could this be its dismembered heart beginning to flutter? The static gets louder, slowly filling up the abandoned hall, until a voice speaks out, crackling and old, cutting into the air. Good afternoon, Fortress Accident en rue de Saint-Gueslaine. This is East Inflindian Repeater Station 1. Please repeat. Is this the production schedule? Let's see. Why did you call me Fortress Accident? Fortress Accident is the company on whose name the terminal you are currently using has been registered to. Do you have any other information about this company? One moment. You hear her flip through a catalog before she reads out with studious care. Fortress Accident SCA produces revolutionary interactive call-in radio games. That's what the catalog says. That's not bad. Wow, so conceptual. Hmm. And what's that, this interactive call-in radio game? Any other questions? What's the production schedule? The filament you have inserted into the reader. Alright, thanks for the explanation. That was a question. Have you inserted it into the core? Yes. Good. Please repeat the password. Oh no, I don't know what the password is. Password. Of course it would have a password. That's why there's a human administrator involved. You should ask her for a hint. A password? I'm really bad with passwords. Can you give me a hint? No. Well, the suggestion was that I ask her and it didn't really give me much. A hint system is not part of the protocol for repeater stations. Is it my birthday? No. This is the police. Please open up this thing. I am contractually obliged to protect the privacy of the filament holder for trust accident. Without filing a warrant with Lintel, I cannot give you access to this filament. I'm afraid we are not doing that, unless we want to wait for a month. Now, can you please repeat the password? Guess there's nothing for it. I don't know the password. Received. I will register this login attempt. Don't worry. Passwords have a way of turning up sooner or later. Fortress accident. Is there anything else I can do for you today? What are you, a machine? Or are you alive? Yes, I am alive. I am 74 years old and my name is Yvonne. She repeats passwords. Programming people are all paranoid. Let's see. Yvonne, my partner, tells me that you're here because radio computer guys are all paranoid. They are merely cautious. It's my job to protect their filaments as a password repeater at the East Insulindian Station. Okay, but where are you? How did you know where I am? I work as a repeater at the East Indian Repeater Station. It's my job to know where you are, Fortress Accident. As for me, well, I am sitting in my cubicle, surrounded by a wall of radios. Now, please tell me if there is anything else I can do, Fortress Accident. That's all for now. Thank you, and goodbye. Tiles on the cube are still smoldering, casting the framework in a soft glow. 
Fluorescent play and print keys shine on the keyboard. Nothing happens. So I need to find the password somewhere. More money, and what is that? Magnesium. I need something for my health here. That's what I really need. You see a terrifying ice bear with a strange compartment in its belly. The door is covered in frost and the bear's eyes are glowing red. The bear looks oddly realistic. Is it taxidermy? What is this thing? It looks like a giant ice bear. The lieutenant doesn't answer. His eyes are glued to the animal. A sharp slice of light shines out from its mysterious belly door. Crack open the door. A gust of freezing cold air rushes to greet you. You hear a low grumble as the bear regulates itself. This is the inside of a refrigerator. The lieutenant takes a peek inside. His hand has found the holster of his gun. Relax, Kim. It's a fridge. Of course. Just a giant ice bear shaped fridge. He relaxes his hand, his face bathed in the harsh light of the open fridge door. Let's take a look inside. The shelves are empty. All you see are crumpled ice cream wrappers with the brand name, Revachol Ice City. A handwritten note has been attached to the door. The fridge is huge. Let me take the note from you the door. the note and the little fridge magnets keeping it on the door. Examine one of the ice cream wrappers in there. A friendly cartoon bear smiles back at you from a glossy cellophane wrapper. It looks nothing like the fridge. What is a giant bear-shaped fridge doing in an abandoned cellar in the first place? Good question. It looks like an ice cream fridge. The lieutenant reaches for one of the wrappers. He studies it in the light. So they try to sell ice cream from this hyper carnivore? I know. What an unfortunate marketing choice. What is even worse, the bear is still costing them money to this day. The lieutenant points at the red snaky cable running from the fridge. The fridge buzzes with energy. The electricity bill on this thing must be catastrophic. Let me take a look at the note that I found there. Handwritten note from the fridge. A handwritten note you found from the giant ice bear fridge. It still bears some marks from fruit-shaped kitchen magnets that were used to secure it to the refrigerator door. The note is written with a blue pencil on a piece of lined office paper. The kitchen magnets have left spots on its surface. Does it say anything interesting? The lieutenant leans closer to read the crumpled note over your shoulder. This is tangential at best, but the lieutenant's detective instinct is still active. Read the notes. Someone has scribbled. S. I can't believe the off-site copy is still here. The illiterate ginger kid keeps stealing stuff from the studio, so I had to hide it somewhere safe. Let's see. Okay, so the off-site copy is still here and he hid it somewhere you safe. You find the filament memory with the off-site copy in the frozen ice cream maker. Please take it home. ASAP. It's important. I'd do it myself if I lived in a civilized place with a freezer. Take care, Suliswaf. I wonder who wrote that note. Looks like someone from that radio game company upstairs. I'm a little surprised they just left their property lying here. Maybe they had to leave in a hurry. That's a plausible hypothesis. Remind me again, what's a filament memory? It belongs inside a radio computer, storing its memory. It's like a tape. You listen to disco tapes, right? It's like one of your disco tapes, only for a computer. So who's the illiterate ginger kid? Some local miscreant, probably. There are tons of them running around in Martinez, ready to stir up trouble. We usually dispatch our junior officers to deal with them. Do you have any idea where the frozen ice cream maker could be? I don't know. I assume it's somewhere close to the ice bear fridge. Let me put the note away. Okay. Very good. So that is going to do it for this episode. In the next one, I will continue the investigation up here. I hope you guys are having fun. I know I am. It's a lot of fun. See you guys next time.
thanks for stopping by the Renaissance Gaming Monastery. I hope you join our community on Discord and Twitter. These videos are produced with a lot of hard work and love. If you think they're worth a dollar, I'd be grateful for your contribution. You can send a thanks donation or become a member on YouTube. You can also support through PayPal, Patreon, or even with cryptocurrency. All links are in the description. See you on the next video.